Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start at the very least on my review of An Apology for Idlers by Robert Louis Stevenson. So as always, I'm going to read you the blur, but then I'm going to go and check out some of my tabs and I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. I will say that this is part of the Penguin Great Ideas series, and it consists of An Apology for Idlers, Letter to a Young Gentleman Who Proposes to Embrace the Career of Art, On Falling in Love, Crabbed Age and Youth, on the enjoyment of unpleasant places, Fontainebleau, village communities of painters, the old Pacific capital, and forest notes, idle hours. So, the blow. Dane reads. An irresistible invitation to reject the work ethic and enjoy life's simple pleasures, such as laughing, drinking, and lying in the open air. Robert Louis Stevenson's witty and seminal essay on the joys of idleness is accompanied here by his writings on, among other things, growing old, visiting unpleasant places, and the overwhelming experience of falling in love. So, let's check out some tabs. So I like this very beginning, this is a quote uh, from a conversation between Boswell and Johnson. So Boswell said, we grow weary when idle. And Johnson said, that is sir, because others being busy, we want company. But if we were idle, there would be no growing weary. We should all entertain one another which I think is a nice idea. And I like this little mini part of a paragraph here. He said, It is a sore thing to have laboured along and scaled the arduous hilltops, and when all is done, find humanity indifferent to your achievement. Hence, physicists condemn the unphysical. Financiers have only a superficial toleration for those who know little of stocks. Literary persons despise the unlettered, and people of all pursuits combine to disparage those who have none. So overall, I thought that was a really interesting little essay. Uh, and then we have the letter to the young gentleman. To know what you like is the beginning of wisdom and of old age. Youth is wholly experimental. The essence and charm of that unquiet and delightful epoch is ignorance of self as well as ignorance of life. These two unknowns the young man brings together again and again, now in the airiest touch, now with a bitter hug, now with exquisite pleasure, now with cutting pain, but never with indifference, to which he is a total stranger, and never with that near kinsman of indifference, contentment. If he be a youth of dainty senses or a brain easily heated, the interest of this series of experiments grows upon him out of all proportion to the pleasure he receives. It is not beauty that he loves, nor pleasure that he seeks, though he may think so. His design and his sufficient reward is to verify his own existence and taste the variety of human fate. There's actually some really good advice in here for people who do want to get into the arts. So for example he says, um, Lastly we come to those vocations which are at once decisive and precise, to the men who are born with the love of pigments, the passion of drawing, the gift of music or the impulse to create with words, just as other and perhaps the same men are born with the love of hunting or the sea or horses or the turning lathe. These are predestined. If a man love the labour of any trade, apart from any question of success or fame, the gods have called him. He may have the general vocation too, he may have a taste for all the arts, and I think he often has. But the mark of his calling is this laborious partiality for one, this inextinguishable zest in its technical successes, and, perhaps above all, a certain candour of mind, to take his very trifling enterprise with a gravity that would befit the cares of empire, and to think the smallest improvement worth accomplishing at any expense of time and industry. The book, the statue, the sonata, must be gone upon with the unreasoning good faith and the unflagging spirit of children at their play. Is it worth doing? When it shall have occurred to any artist to ask himself that question, it is implicitly answered in the negative. It does not occur to the child as he plays at being a pirate on the dining room sofa, nor to the hunter as he pursues his quarry, and the candour of the one and the ardour of the other should be united in the bosom of the artist. So here we have from On Falling in Love, and I thought this was interesting because he talks about how we kind of almost expect people to have had no history before we fall in love with them. It is not exactly jealousy, however, that we feel when we reflect on the past of those we love. A bundle of letters found after years of happy union creates no sense of insecurity in the present, and yet it will pain a man sharply. The two people entertain no vulgar doubt of each other, but this pre-existence of both occurs to the mind as something indelicate. To be altogether right, they should have had twin births together at the same moment with the feeling that unites them. Th then indeed it will be simple and perfect and without reserve or afterthought. Then they would understand each other with a fullness impossible otherwise. There would be no barrier between them of associations that cannot be imparted. They would be led into none of those comparisons that send the blood back to the heart. And they would know that there had been no time lost, and they had been together as much as was possible. For besides terror for the separation that must follow some time or other in the future, men feel anger and something like remorse when they think of that other separation which endured until they met. Someone has written that loves make people believe in immortality, because there seems not to be room enough in life for so great a tenderness, and it is inconceivable that the most masterful of our emotions should have no more than the spare moments of a few years. Indeed, it seems strange, but if we call to mind, anal but if we call to mind analogies, we can hardly regard it as impossible. Alright, and then we're going to skip in here a little bit, so this is to Fontainebleau village communities of painters and there's just this great little line here no art it may be said was ever perfect and not many noble that has not been mirthfully conceived and then we have the old pacific capital 
And then we have the old Pacific Capital here, and I just wanted to flag the little bit of casual racism here, so it says, Even the despised Chinese have taught the youth of California, not indeed of their virtues, but the debasing use of opium, and chief among those influences, that of the Mexicans. Yeah, you've got to have a bit of a race, racism in an old book, eh? But um, other than that, I did enjoy an apology for idlers. To be honest, mostly it's just the uh, the apology for idlers and the letter to a young gentleman who proposes to embrace the career of art. Um, those are the main bits I enjoyed. Unfortunately, that only takes us to page 25 of about 110. Um, so I think with, without any other stuff with just those two bits, it would have been a 4 out of 5, but as, then it got watered down a bit. So I gave this a 3.5 out of 5. So there we have it, that's what I made of an apology for idlers. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this, if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.